Hello everyone and welcome to another interview from Red Bull Wololo 6. So yeah, I'm here with the Viper, one of the best players in the world, perhaps the best and best in history perhaps as well. We're going to talk about that. So yeah, hello Viper. Um, how are you? Thank you for accepting this interview. Hello, I'm good. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Great. So would you mind telling me your full name, your age and how long you've played Age of Empires? So my name is Orion Larsen. I'm from Norway. I'm, I'm thirty. Am I thirty? Yeah, I think I'm thirty right now. Uh, yeah, and I, I tried to jump press as a kid with my father, uh, but I started properly like uh, to really grind the game probably like early 2010, late 2009. So roughly thirteen years now, I would say. Mm -hmm. proper proper gaming <laughs> okay so yeah i know pk uh, pkz uh, is your father right the founder of aoc zone if i'm not uh, uh wrong did you start playing because of him then uh how how was that yeah uh i think a lot of people have that experience where they're a child or a kid and they watch their father or brother older brother or whatever play a video game and for me that was age of empires it was so cool i watched my dad uh he was hunting these lions with his villagers in Age of Empires 1, and I was just so intrigued and fascinated by that. And obviously once Age of Empires 2 came out, he bought that as well, and he played it, and slowly he started letting me play the game as well, here and there. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so a lot of viewers know you from the era you hardly uh, lost any game, yeah, and won most of the tournaments uh, out there. I would like to know if there was a Viper before this, right? I know you played a lot of Land Nomad. How did you start uh, your Age of Empires career? So, I played a lot of scenarios uh, in the past, like from probably like 2005 to 2010. I, I still dabbled in Age of Empires during summer vacations and such, but Mostly then I played uh, Lord of the Rings scenarios and such with a community, which, uh, which for example, Dave was also a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny that me and Dave now are both part of the pro scene in one <laughs> way. And we both played like 17 years ago, we played Lord of the Rings scenarios together. Um, but uh, well, sorry, I, I forgot. Oh, yeah, was there a Viper before this? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, once I started playing properly, I my dad always played, played Land Nomad. So I kind of got into that as well. And for probably a solid year, year and a half after I started playing, properly i played only in that land nomad but uh, like I, I felt like i was a pretty good player because i had 2k rating in land nomad mm -hmm. like from land nomad but then i signed up for my first tournament ever which was an arabia tournament <laughs> and i lost to a 1500 1600 player oh. in only one and my <laughs> elo was over 2000 so my my pride took a bit of a sting there uh, then i realized that land nomad is such a different game mode to, to uh, arabia for example so uh, i and i I had, I felt like I was a good player, so I felt like I wanted to improve, and uh, that was kind of my first awakening that, yeah, I, I gotta try and play some other maps as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So then you joined RVK. Uh, can you tell me a little bit how that went? How did you go from a land nomad player that couldn't beat a 1500 in Arabia to a, yeah, an RV, uh, RVK player? For those who don't know, the clan it's one uh, of the biggest clans in the moment. I think it was uh, the first or the second best uh, clan, right? So yeah, I think there was Jordan, Rio, Dogao. How, how did that go? Yeah, so as I started playing other maps, I slowly got better and better, especially on full random. I was uh, fairly good, uh, where it was more like water maps and hybrid maps, because a lot of people were only playing Arabia. So I felt like I got a little bit, I could have gotten an edge on them through playing these hybrid maps, continental, islands, migration. I played a lot of those mm -hmm. through the full random. Um, so I was able to get to a skill level where I kept winning. I could win most of the big names as well, eventually. And um, yeah, there was the World Clan League 7 that came around, and RVK was Jordan Rio Togao, as you mentioned. But they wanted a fourth player as well, just to like have another player to help for training. Uh, then maybe someone had a bad day or wasn't gone, they couldn't play. Uh, so I was asked by Togao if I was interested in joining. And um, yeah, it was an easy answer to say yes, obviously. Because <laughs> for me, those, Rio was possibly the best player then without, because he won the... 2007, he won the, I don't remember the name anymore, Clash, no, something. Uh, he won a big tournament back then, oh, and where he beat out in the final. And Dugao was obviously a legend, Jordan was really good. Um, and yeah, RVK was the second best team at that point. It was a Tyrant who came back. They were kind of the big guns. RVK wanted to try and 
go above them. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, but uh, it was still it was an amazing experience for me. Yeah, great. So I remember you training. Uh, now that you said it, I remember you training uh, some a lot of continental with uh, a guy named Gene uh, or Ares from Canada, I think. So yeah, in a time where most players played only Arabia, uh, do you think playing multiple settings uh, was an important part of you uh, of your path to becoming the best player in the world? So me and Gene, we played a lot of different maps, and we kind of. Um... For us, it was more like we didn't actually play to like, hey, I'm gonna try and win this game. It was like I play, we played, and then it was like, in the middle of the game, we could start criticizing each other. It was like, oh yeah, you, you, these villagers are idle; they shouldn't be there. Why are you doing this? Or like, why are you making this unit? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so we were super critical of like, just small things, like as well. Also, like with Franks, like should you make one or two farms before fuel age in order to get so you get the horse color for free? All these small things we kind of discussed and like kind of came to like logical conclusions and I think that helped me a lot but yeah also playing all the different types of maps um I think that's why I also kind of had an edge on a lot of people when because like a lot of people were like Arabia mains but usually when there were like hybrid maps in the mix or mixed maps I was usually a clear favorite against most people and I think that probably from what you said it probably has something to do with the fact that I did play a lot of these different types of maps during that time Mm -hmm. But it was also because I felt like I could win people on these maps. So it was also an extra motivation for me to try and get these maps against certain opponents when I was getting better. Because I knew I would still lose to doubt 9 out of 10 times on like Arabia. Mm -hmm. But once we played full random, I could maybe win 2, 3, 4 games. And that was an extra motivation for me to get really good on those maps as well. And uh, I think, yeah, it definitely helped in that regard. Okay, great. So I see uh, you still say that you lost 9 out of 10, uh, 10 times versus Doubt. So I want to know uh, when uh, Tyrant approached you, right? How did that go? You were in RVK with uh, Jordan, with Ryud, with uh, Jordan I think was already your, your friend. So how did the transition to a clan like Tyrant go? So Tyrant was obviously there, were, it was a, there was a lot of talk and we knew that Tyrant players were being paid as well to train and play, right? Mm -hmm. So that's for people that had a dream of esports and competing in esports. It was mm -hmm. always a dream to get some sort of like salary and whatnot for playing the video game, right? It's like crazy, crazy thinking. The dream. Uh, yeah. So Grunt and Halen, Halen, uh, both of them were retiring or quitting the game after World Clan League 7. So the Tyrant sponsor wanted to continue, so he needed two new players. And uh, I was surprised that I was approached because. Still on paper, maybe Ryu Togao, Jordan were all considered better players than me. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we played a lot of training games with Tyrant as well. And Cab, I think he had a feeling that I was better than what it seemed like and that I should have played more games. Because I remember as well, he said after World Clan League 7 where Tyrant did win RVK in the final, he said he was happy that I didn't play more games. Um, okay. But also, it felt weird. Like I felt like I could not intrude into like like Togao, Jordan, Riot had such a good chemistry, and those three were amazing together. So I also don't blame them for not playing me more, so to say. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was asked if I wanted to join, and Jordan was asked as well. And I'm not sure why they chose the two of us exactly. I can't say that specifically. Maybe just Cab had a sense of personalities and talent and potential that would fit into the team. I don't know. I can't say, but yeah, we were we were asked, and it was like an immediate. Uh, yeah, we we can't say no to this. So yes. Mm -hmm. Short time after, you you both were the both two the the both the the best players in the world, right? So I think Cap has an eye for that, I guess. Yeah, yeah great to hear. Um, I didn't know that. Um, I, th oh. I think the like me and Jordan kind of like after the World Cup League Seven. I think that's kind of where it started for me and Jordan because we started grinding a lot of only ones and. Especially being invited to Tyrant, it was an extra motivation to just go ahead and try to become the best. So yeah, I think all of these combinations uh, is what led to that. Of course, great. Yeah. In a time where money was hard to make from Age of Empires, that sounds like something amazing. Uh, such a huge uh, sponsor. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about uh, Kakab. So I, I think you pronounced Cab. Perhaps I'm pronouncing wrong. Uh, he was a, a South Korean player, right? Um, yeah. 
So he was a very intelligent player and also known for helping players to train and be at the top. I remember him uh, imitating some other playstyle to help people improve or something like that. I remember him doing that with Doubt. I don't know if he did uh, that with you too. But do you think he was a, a big part of your improvement as a player? I don't think he like I don't think he had a direct impact on my development as a one v one player or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of people have a misconception of Cap, they think he was this strategic mastermind, where he wasn't really a strategic mastermind. He was more of a he would he would grind like as an example. We had uh, there's a map where you start on an island and you have to like tra uh, transport your villagers out to the side to put a TC. Yeah, uh, it was a four v four map. Uh, but what Cav did, yeah, yeah, something. the centering exactly. Something like that. What Cav did, he trained build orders for every civilization. Right? He had like <laughs> four, five, six civilizations that we were thinking about using in that map. Okay. He would train build orders, probably fifty games, which each civilization, and he would tell us what's the best opening and what's the build order for our civilizations. That's what Cav did. He grinded all the tiny details in terms of the opening. Um, for Land Nomad, for example, he made a massive guide on like where where's like where your villagers are spawning, and like what's the natural position of where the deer is likely to be, considering where your villagers spawn. <laughs> like all those tiny details, that's what he did and was so good at. And like it was just immaculate work ethic. Honestly, I've never seen a guy work that hard off out of the game. Mm -hmm. Again, it was not about coming up with strategies. Strategies was more a combination of me, Jordan, and Cab, usually. Doubt never showed up, so <laughs> shocker, right? <laughs> uh, that was usually how we came up with strategies. But uh, yeah, Cab was all about the tiny details. And Cab is a really underestimated player as well. Again, I don't know if it's pronounced Cab or K-Cab. I always said Cab. But, <laughs> OK. Um, he, um, I, when we trained one ones for one one tournaments, Cab was the one who had the best win rate against me out of all the other players. Like okay. I would train with Jordan, oh, wow. Doubt, everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have probably 80% win rate maybe against those in training. And then Cab would probably, he would also not beat me more than I beat him, but mm -hmm. like he was the one who won more games against me than the others. Um, so I think he was a really underestimated player. That doesn't mean that I think he was a better player than the others. No, mm -hmm. it was probably stylistically as well that Cab maybe had a better idea of how to play against me as well. Uh, but yeah, Cab, uh, also amazing human being. Yeah. He's, he's just a fantastic guy. He seems like a man of uh, commitment and sheer effing will, right? So yes, that's, for sure. that's pretty cool to, to hear. Yeah, he was a very mysterious guy. So hearing uh, from him, uh, uh, f uh, from you, right? Uh, from f um, some, someone that was very close to him is very interesting. So if you don't think that Cab molded your playstyle of 1v1 uh, a lot, perhaps more in team games or perhaps uh, in other ways he helped you, what other players do you think you learned from or what do you, what other players do you think you mirrored yourself in when you when making your own playstyle if any so when i was starting to get better uh, i used to look a lot to a guy called athena i'm not sure if you remember his name yes. he was one of the yeah the i don't remember the name of the clan anymore but it was like immortals immortals was his name mm -hmm. he was a uh, athena he was a really good land nomad but he also played other maps and that's why I got kind of inspired watching him because I used to play Land Nomad with him, but then I saw that he was also like playing the big tournaments and like being really good on other maps. Um, so initially I tried to follow him a bit and see what he did right to try and copy him a little bit. But as I grew better, um, I looked more towards people like Doubt, for example. Um, I think my, my play style is very similar to Doubt in many ways. Uh, but I probably have slightly better micro and a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I think our play styles are very similar. Um, otherwise, in general, just like playing tons of games, which, for example, Jordan also helps mold your play style. But uh, yeah, I think those would be the main the main things. Mm -hmm. It's a shame I already interviewed Doubt, so I couldn't. I can tell you, I can tell him <laughs> that. So yeah, Perfect. it would be very, it would be funny. Yeah. Um, so okay, uh, be ready, Viper, because I'm going to to bring something uh, very wrong right now. Okay, so this will be very hard to answer. No, just kidding. It's a it's a, a nice thing from over ten years ago. So I remember you having a, a few differences with a Chinese player uh, named Tim. Mm -hmm. I don't know if more uh, most of the people watching this are, uh, know him, but he was 
was one of the best players at the time, as well as you, of course, who wrote in one game something like Grass Your Sister, which was very famous for years in AOC Zone forums and, and others. So, of course, a typo from him, uh, but very funny still. Um, was he your biggest rival in Age of Empires? Were, were there other rivals that you had in your Age of Empires career? So I don't think Tim necessarily was a rival. Uh, probably in that period, people viewed it as a, as a bit of a rivalry mm -hmm. because of our differences there. Uh, I think he just put like something nasty in Google Translate and it came out like, grass <laughs> your sister. Uh, but obviously, it helped it become a meme as well, right? On my channel as well, on Twitch, I had grass as my prefix for emotes, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's all been a good meme in the end. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was obviously like, we're 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 friendly with each other. There's no issue now. It was just younger, more tempered uh, minds. Of course. Um, yeah, right. I mean, Jordan obviously comes to mind as a big rival of me for many years. Uh, I think Leary as well would be a second one. Like Jordan, through my first years where I was considered one of the top players, and then later years I would say Leary maybe, mm -hmm. as a he was the young one, up and coming, and like the one to challenge me if you want to say that like mm -hmm. that um i think those two would be the standouts probably in terms of like rivalries that have lasted like where it's been like multiple years of uh, them being the main contender to uh, to my to the to the tournament tournament victories i've had mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So I know you weren't a big fan of walls back then as well. I, th I thought perhaps it had something to do with it. Uh, do you think that the metagame has changed a lot from uh, walling uh, like Tim used to do? I, I don't know if, uh, if uh, uh, who is watching know this, but Tim was a very big waller in a time where in Arabia it wasn't such a... A normal thing to do, right? Stonewalling minute uh, 12 and just uh, being behind your walls. I remember Bacti doing it back then as well. But nowadays people seem to uh, wall more, right? I remember you, for example, playing very, very open uh, and remember you as a, an open kind of player. But nowadays, of course, in tournaments uh, to win, you have to wall a lot more. Do you think the meta has shifted or uh, was it uh, already like this before? I think in one way it has always been like this in like in terms of like winning strategies walling is super important and most probably the most if, if you don't wall you're leaving yourself open to unnecessary danger which will most likely lose the use will lose you the games um back then i mean when i played tim i i lost the tournament once where i resigned by saying gg well walled so <laughs> i remember that. that tells you everything about how i felt about that back then because he would always just full stone wall right away and I always played open, so he full stonewalled and then he snuck his army around the edge of the map into my base and <laughs> killed like 10 villagers and it's like so frustrating while I'm just hitting, knocking my head against his walls. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't think the meta, I mean, it has changed. Like back then I used to play way more open, like Jordan would as well, Ryut. But it was more, more because we felt like we were a level above everyone else. We could mm -hmm. like put that challenge upon ourselves and play open and like, yeah, I, I challenge you, right? Uh, to try and beat me even though i'm not walled um i think the level has risen a lot where we're not that far ahead anymore also multitasking macro wise i think a lot of people are very good now to the point where walling cannot be ignored like back then we could i could just out micro and out macro and outpace everyone mm -hmm. by while playing open now people are good enough that they will secure their angles vulnerable angles with walls and they will make sure they do a, the right counterattack and punish you for not walling. Um, I mean, meta always changes with balance changes. So recent years, we have way more differences in terms of how the meta develops compared to in the past. But I, I still think the core of the game where walling is necessary has always been there. Uh, it's just that people have embraced it way more in recent years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So about that, uh, about the GG wall, for example, do you think you're a more chill player nowadays? Uh, back in the days, you used to try hard your way to the top, I imagine. So yeah, do you think nowadays you're a more chill player? I, I know you talk a lot with your audience as well when you play uh, in your stream. Do you think that makes you more calm as well in Age of Empires uh, settings? Or do you think it's because you already have 10 years in the scene, being uh, the best in the world, so you, you have to be more chilled how does, does that look for you i think it's a combination of everything uh obviously 
maturing as a person, a human being to begin with, mm -hmm. and getting more experience in the game. Just more, I mean, back then when I, I, I haven't had many incidents where I've felt like frustration or, uh, frustration, yes, but not like where I would actually vent on other people. Mm -hmm. Like the GG Well World. That was like just, <laughs> like, I felt like this, his play style was just so uh, annoying. Annoying for me. Yeah, exactly. And for me, for me, it was like, Back then, I was I couldn't appreciate the fact that he just had a different style and he just used that style to win games. Mm -hmm. I couldn't appreciate that. I didn't accept that. It was like just frustrating for me. Um, but yeah, obviously, the whole thing of just the experience of playing the game a lot, participating in tournaments, growing up as a person and player, uh, realizing like more the mental game, right? For me, like losing games isn't a problem. Um, I feel like the only times you get angry or upset about losing games is usually things that happen are your own mistakes. Like if the reason I lost those games was because I didn't win myself, right? Why would I get angry at him? It's mm -hmm. my it's my fault, <laughs> right? It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Uh, it's just those types of mentality things. Like losing is part of the journey to become good as well. It's uh, uh, it, yeah, it helps. And also the whole interaction. Like I've streamed for years now as well. It's like. You kind of get used to the whole have a bit more chill approach to the game and just if things happen bad things happen just laugh about it right it's, it's just fun it's just a game um, mm -hmm. of course if you're playing for thousands of dollars it might be a little <laughs> bit of a different experience yeah but uh yeah in general I, yeah I, to summarize the answer to your question is yes i'm a way more chill player right now compared to like 10 years ago, although I would say I was very chill back then as well. You were, but. yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent answer, actually. Uh, yeah, how, how you grew as a person, along as a player, right? Uh, with so many years uh, going by. So, okay, fast question. Tell me your top five players all time. You can name yourself if you like to. See, this is a bit difficult for me because I never, I didn't play or was active during the days of Coven and all those guys back in like 2005 and such because like everyone always talks about Coven but then I talked to Doubt and Doubt is like yeah Coven is overrated <laughs> like he was a good player but he was never as good as people say for example mm -hmm. um, so for me uh, let's say top five I'll, ex I'll exclude myself okay um, are we talking I mean also top five is defined differently right is it just whoever peaked top five the highest skill levels ever is it uh, history in the game is it achievements in the game there's so many different ways to uh, define it but uh, let's say Jordan has to be in there for sure for me. Okay. Doubt has to be there. Mm -hmm. No question about that. Um, I would say you have to include Leary as well, considering okay. his recent, uh, like all the Red Bull wins and uh, how competitive he was for so many years. That's actually a really tough one. <laughs> you can I include like yourself. I, that would be for it. I won't. Uh, okay. I feel like... I feel like I would add Cab as well, but Cab is more like a, you need to play with him and be with him in order to understand how good he really was. So you might also not have the same appreciation outside mm -hmm. of the game. Um, maybe Ryut as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. let's go with those. Uh, else I, will, I could sit there for like 50, 50 <laughs> minutes and try to figure out who's the top five for me are, but yeah. Well, I, I was actually amazed by, by you picking Riot as well. I remember him as being one of the best players in the world. I, I remember him, for example, being one of the only guys who uh, won Doubt as his, at his prime. Or I don't know if at his prime or in one very big uh, tournament there was. And I remember him being just amazing player with scouts, right? Everyone was talking about yeah. him with the scouts. So it's very interesting to, to hear you mention him. him. So, yeah, uh, could you tell me one player that uh, people don't give enough credit to or that is, uh, uh, quote unquote, underrated? This is also a tricky question because whoever I said is, whoever I say now is going to be implied that people don't respect him enough for his skill. No, not um, really. I, th I think it goes more than... Uh, I don't know, he couldn't uh, win a lot of tournaments because he wasn't, I don't know, uh, at the time he couldn't for any any reason or perhaps people don't see him as a top 10 player in, in the world, but yeah. he was very good or something like that. I think I think if you asked me a year ago, I would say Taro. Okay. But I think Taro has had enough of results now the last year where people are not viewing him that way anymore. Um, hmm. Also, not a very tricky question. Uh, honestly, maybe even doubt. 
Okay. Doubt still has has it in him to. I mean, but then again, you see Doubt as well taking wins of Leary here and there, and still having great results. I don't know. That's such a hard question as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe Dugao actually. Dugao oh. is a fantastic player, mm -hmm. team game and one v one, and he he hasn't had the best results, a bit up and down, but he is a fantastic player, and I don't think he as well gets enough credit. But yeah, if we go all the way back, probably I can say Cab. Okay, yeah, great, great, great names. Um, could you tell me a little bit, and uh, now unrelated, could you tell me a little bit about Jordan Viper era? Uh, I, th I know that you both were considered one and two by virtually everyone. Yeah, so, and you were very good friends as well. Did you train with each other a lot? Like, did you uh, practice with each other uh, much? What did it make so, uh, what did make it possible for you both to be the both players, uh, the both best players in the world at the time? I think a lot of it had to do with timing. Uh, we both were, I mean, we're, we're actually only two days apart. He had, I'm not sure, did I freeze here? Yes. For you? Oh, okay, but I think it then freezed. Okay, it's back, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, like I said, timing. But first of all, it's funny that me and Jordan are only, like he's two days older than me. And <laughs> we're actually so close. But we all kind of entered the face of our Age of Empires rise at the same time. Uh, he had played the game way longer than me, uh, consistently and actively, so he was at a higher level for way longer. But when we both joined Tyrant was kind of where we both really excelled. Of course, the motivation of everything surrounding being in Tyrant, also being in team with Doubt, playing with Doubt a lot, um, playing with a shutter. And when two players with high ambitions and good, a good ceiling when it comes to skill level and potential, go and knock heads nonstop for a year or two it's just you're bound to get better and mm -hmm. that was kind of the situation for both of us we obviously we play a lot together uh both ladder games uh, in training uh team games as well tournaments together and against each other and yeah it was just a natural ri rivalry developing alongside our very good friendship as well and we just um we just Im naturally improved i think uh, to the point where we were considered probably the two best players for like a solid year or two, maybe mm. longer. Yeah, I think it. I think it was a little bit longer, but yeah. So, how does it feel to be the best player in the world? I mean, pressure-wise, right? Uh, did you feel like you had to beat everyone in every tournament game? Uh, didn't that bother you, or was it very good because you thought, yeah, I, I, I think I can take anyone? Uh, how was that for you? Yeah, uh, in your mind, uh, how did that work? I think I'm a very confident player in many ways. I, I think I can outplay everyone within every metric of the game. I think I can out micro everyone, out micro everyone, out strategize everyone, if I put my mind to it. Now, being consistent is very difficult. Um, through a couple of years there, I mean, through the whole era, you can say, where I was winning a lot of tournaments, um, I never have been the guy who feel pressure from the outside. If anything, I, the only pressure I feel is on myself because I have ambitions myself and I know what level I can play at and I know what level I want to play at. And for the big tournaments, if I don't achieve that level, like I don't mind if I lose games as long as I achieve the level I want to play at. Because if I don't play as good as I want to play, I'll be unhappy about my performance. <laughs> However, if I, if I played amazing, I feel like I played one of the best games of my life and I still lost, then it's like just applause to my opponent, right? Because he played better. Uh, but that's the mindset I have in mentality where it's like, I don't feel the pressure from the outside, but from the inside. And throughout the whole fer period as well, yeah, I felt like I was probably a level above most of the other players. And I felt like I could, even if I lost a game or two, I felt like I could always, um, I could always switch, switch up a gear or two. And especially when tournaments came around, I, I love playing tournaments, man, especially land events. You just get a whole different um, spark of motivation in your body and when you sit down, especially on the land, and you sit on the table and you see your opponent in the side of your eye, it's a, uh, it's also an extra. It's really hard to explain, but it's like imagine a big game player, Messi. If he plays Champions League final, he's gonna be as motivated as he. I don't want to compare myself to Messi. This comes <laughs> like that now, but like uh, any any top player with a top mentality kind of thing, they will always get even extra motivation by the big moments, right? And I I just love tournaments. 
I think that helps a lot as well. So uh, instead of getting nervous, I probably get like extra motivation. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So yeah, is there uh, what what is the main difference uh, from playing LAN and online that you mentioned right now? So what what's the main difference? Looking at your opponent in the eye, knowing that you are live playing for a lot of viewers, perhaps that it's going broadcasted. I don't know what what is the the motivation to play LAN as well. I don't know. It's something about the atmosphere, right? The fact that you're both present there. Uh, every, everyone is present there, right? There could even be a live audience uh, on on the location, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, when you play online, you're at home, you're at your comfortable setup, you have your chair, you have your desk, your monitors, your PC, everything. So that's, in some ways, that's a bit more comfortable. While on a land situation, you're, everyone is kind of thrown out of their comfort element and you're like, all right, you're here. He's here, you have to perform right now, here and now on this location where it's foreign for both of you. And the pressure is a bit different. And uh, I don't know, I just, I just really enjoy it. Great, yeah. So in Red Bull Wololo 1, uh, where you lost the final to Mr. Yo, it was one of the big uh, tournaments that you didn't win, right? Uh, how did it feel? I mean, second place is, is in such a huge tournament, is an excellent place, and it will be everyone's dream to even play a final in such a huge tournament. But perhaps your uh, expectation and, like you say, your inner uh, pressure uh, were too high. I don't know. How did you take that? Um, usually when I lose tournaments, I, I'll be a bit, or like if, if it's a tournament, I really wanted to win. If I'm streaming a casual tournament, I'm not too bothered about it more often than not. But yeah, I did obviously not, I wasn't very happy with that result. Um, I don't remember how it was, but I remember I felt drained and I felt like every strategy I went for was just hard counted by him. I'm not sure if we had like back to back where I played this last time I finally and had to go straight into the final. I think I that think was so. the case. Yes. Yeah. So I was a bit tired, but still, uh, he also had he had uh, watched the whole final I just played, right? And so, and I was not smart enough to change up my strategy. So I went for exactly the same thing on some maps, and he kind of just um, uh, he hard countered it. Like mm -hmm. I, I, especially the last game, Land Madness, where I was Tutans, he knew exactly what I was going for because I used it previously, and he just hard countered it. Um, but yeah, Yo played exceptionally well that, that series as well. Um, but yeah, I was very, very unhappy with how I performed, as I tend to be. But uh, that's the only thing you can change something about, right? I can't change whether Yo played amazing or not. I can only change and focus on what I could have done better. And that's usually how I approach tournament losses. But they don't feel great. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's actually very interesting, right? Because, I, yeah, it would be anyone's dream to be like second place in Red Bull Ololo with such a huge prestige and such a huge amount of prize pool. It's interesting uh, knowing a little more about your feelings. But after that, there was a second final you played and then you were champion of the biggest one yet, right? Red Bull 5. Did you train harder than other editions or what changed there? I just want to point out, obviously, like, I'll be upset the first day, but like, when you put things in perspective later, you'll, you'll still be satisfied with like a second place. So it's not like I'm going around today and still unhappy with that I got second place in Red Bull uh, World War One. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, obviously for the the big thing, Red Bull Legacy. Uh, again, it was a land event. Obviously, that was different. So environment is different for everyone. Uh, we had the Game Edition boot camp, which probably helped a lot as well. Um, but yeah, also, I feel like whenever land events, I feel like I'm always ever able to take my level up a notch. And I feel like that happened during last Rebel as well. Um, even like, I remember I lost to Leary in the group stage uh, of last Rebel. But I remember I told Jordan that I played better than him. So I feel good. And that was after <laughs> losing. But obviously I lost the game. So that, that was like super weird. But like, I, sometimes you can just feel when you're having a good, uh, you, you sometimes have a good feeling whether you win or lose. Mm -hmm. And that's very promising for later stages as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It could be the combination of land event and good preparation with the GL boys. Mm -hmm. About the GL boys, how would you describe uh, Jordan's, Tados, and Dowd playstyles? I ask about these three because they are actually in your same group right now uh, mm -hmm. in Red Bull World of 6. So that was very funny. But yeah, would you describe uh, a little bit of uh, everyone's uh, playstyle? Do you think they are different from each other and from yours? Yeah. 
for sure. Uh, so let's start with Jordan. Uh, okay. Jordan used to have a very aggressive macro-oriented play mm -hmm. back in the day. I think since he came back, he became a little bit more passive in his approach. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more walling, a little bit more macro-oriented. Uh, but Jordan is he is all about execution, right? He is uh, he will train nonstop for a week to get to achieve where, what he wants to achieve and get where he wants to be with a certain sieve or build order or a civilization. So Jordan is very much at this point also execution and macro oriented. Uh, let's say doubt. I think doubt leans more towards strategy these days. I wouldn't say micro very much, but uh, <laughs> strategy and macro is more doubts play style. Tato also very strategic, but Tato is a jack of all trades. He does everything very, very well at the moment. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, he comes up with some real creative strategies sometimes. Sometimes they might look a bit silly, uh, but sometimes they work out and he looks like a genius. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, they're all very good players in different ways. Of course. How would you say it? Uh, it's different? Bo uh, those three players are different from your own playstyle, perhaps? Hmm. I don't know. I, I think I'm maybe more adaptive uh, to like, I, I might enter a game more thinking, okay, I want to do this and that, but I'm just going to adapt to what happens and try to outplay my opponent. I think I'm more in that type of mold where I, sure, I'll try to come up with good strategies and whatnot, but I'll, I'll play a way more adaptive game in many ways than them, I think. It's really hard to dis distinguish though, because we still, a lot of Games and strategies and approaches will look very similar. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Hard to say. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that was a great answer. So do you like Red Bull settings uh, being in Empire Wars and all? Yeah, I, I think it's it's fine. Uh, like, I wouldn't like if Empire Wars became the norm and every tournament was Empire Wars. But the fact that Red Bull has done this now, this will be the sixth edition of uh, Empire Wars with them. I think it's very nice. Uh, it, it, it's a different bit of pacing. Um, it doesn't have the same level of depth as a random map would have, but there's still a lot of uh, fun and exciting things about Empire Wars. And considering Red Bull gives you wings and they're all about fast pace and everything, it makes sense that they made a game mode as well mm -hmm. that was more suited to their brand. And uh, yeah, I mean, I like it as long as it's not every tournament. But to have every couple of months an Empire Wars tournament, I'm all on board that. Yeah, I'm sure we all are, <laughs> of course. Uh, so, by the way, you're only uh, one of only two players to have qualified for age 2 and age 4. How are you going to manage training both games? And will you prioritize priori prioritize one? Yeah, I will, I will definitely prioritize and focus on Age of Empires 2. But I will try and sneak in a little bit of training for AV4 as well. Um, after how the format was announced, I think my chances are a little bit better to make a decent result. I thought it was just going to be like one best of five and then you're out where it was like single elimination. So I was like, I'm probably not going to invest time into trying to do that. But I'm going to try and sneak in a couple of sessions uh, in the evenings maybe. To uh, I've already played the last couple of days, a couple of hours of AOE4 in the evenings uh, to try and regain a little bit of skill level there. But at the same time, if I feel like the AW4 training will have an impact on my AW2 performance, I will probably stop right away. Um, so I guess we're yet to see exactly how it's going to be. But yeah, mm -hmm. focus will be AW2. I'll try to sneak in a little bit of Age of Empires 4 as well. Yeah, great. So I saw you uh, saying something about the seats and you being 14th, uh, when in theory you should be higher, right? You qualified uh, sooner uh, in Twitter. So do you think that affected the way you saw both games? Or do you think you already had pre-established that you would want to play Age of Empires 2 more and Age of Empires 4 if you have some spare time? No, nothing has changed. Uh, I was just... Like, I'm fine with my seed. I was just wondering how they came to that conclusion, right? Because in theory, I qualified as the fourth player, mm -hmm. and suddenly I was seed 14. So it was a bit weird. But uh, they've, they've put out the reasons and how they did the seeding, and I'm fine with it. It's not it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it didn't have any impact on how I'm going to approach either games. Uh, the only thing that impacted it was the formats, when they changed from like single elimination to like GSL group stage kind of thing. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting, right? The, uh, at first it was a single elimination. I think a lot of players uh, gave feedback to Red Bull or perhaps uh, Krasini. I don't know who exactly uh, makes that uh, decision. But yeah, it, it, changed, it changed actually, right? For both games, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, it would have been kind of sad to go there and play. Like, let's say you lose 3-0. You go there, mm -hmm. you lose 3-0, and then you're out. And you have mm -hmm. to travel home. That would be kind of sad. So yeah. I, I think it makes sense to at least like at least let players play over two days or <laughs> yeah. at least two series. Of course. Yeah. So coming back to Age of H2, uh, who is the hardest players pl uh, who is the hardest player to beat in Red Bull Wololo? Uh Leary probably. Okay. Uh, would you say that you're uh, the favorite to become champion again? I would say I'm one of the favorites. Okay. Who are the others? Leary, Hera, Yo, and personally, I would not be surprised if any other GL member as well did very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you play a lot with a team with your team, right? With Team uh, Gamer Legion. So you probably know everything there is to know to these uh, other comp competing players. Does it make it harder or easier to play versus them? Harder for sure. I mean, harder. we all we all know each other super well now, and. We're gonna train together for like almost two weeks, um, so we're we're pretty much gonna be sharing everything with each other. And whenever we face, it will be like, okay, I know everything about you, you know everything about me. <laughs> Let's have some mind games and see what happens. Okay, so Red Bull will six start in eighteen days. Uh, are you ready training? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm playing ladder games and such at the moment, but uh, I'll start more intensifying and spe specializing the or specifying the training more uh, in two days when we travel to Berlin for the GL bootcamp. Yeah, great. So last question, a quick one. You are allowed to bring your keyboard and your mouse. May I ask which one you use? Uh, yeah, I use a Razer Death Adder version 3 Pro mouse, wireless, and I use a Razer Huntsman uh, Tournament Edition keyboard. Yeah. So do you think it makes a difference if you use, uh, what makes more of a difference, the mouse, the keyboard, or perhaps it's just oh. uh, something? Uh, you asked me which one of those two would I bring? No, 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 no. I uh, mean, uh, if you sh if you would recommend a play, the, I ask this and I will uh, just uh, put the context. A lot of players ask what gear to buy when they are starting to play Age of Empires. And naturally, uh, they go to the best player uh, to know, yeah, what do you use? If I yeah. use your mouse, I'm going to become the best player in the world. So something like that, of course. But yeah, uh, what mouse and keyboard do you use and why actually? And if you think that it makes a huge amount of difference, which one you use uh, in your... Yeah, games. I already stated which ones I use, but like, yes. um, I think equipment matters, but not as much as comfort with the equipment, right? You shouldn't buy the best equipment on the market, best equipment on the market, yeah. if you're not comfortable with that. Uh, but still, there is no denying that some mice and keyboard will have better performance than others. Uh, in the end, you need to find what's comfortable for yourself. You cannot buy a copy of the equipment of a pro and think that that's going to change your level. It's not that simple. But, mm -hmm. I mean, equipment can help. Mm -hmm. it, it won't change your level massively. massively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, okay, so I just thought of another question. I'm very sorry. But did you change your... No uh, this is a question for me, actually. Uh, did you change your DE um, hotkeys a lot uh, when you changed from AOC to DE? You had a very, you had a very good uh, set of key uh, hotkeys in AOC, I remember. Did you change them a lot uh, for, for DE? I know there's a lot of new functionality as well and multiple queue. I did not change a lot of the things I had from AOC, but I have taking advantage of a lot of the new features that were introduced. Um, but yeah, my, my hotkeys are also like, they're ever changing. I will update my hotkeys on a yearly basis, not dramatically, but like change one or two hotkeys where I feel like, oh, this is not effective enough. So I should probably change this or, or just try to include some new feature or like, for example, they have now the thing where you can select all military units on screen with a hotkey, for example, things like that. Uh, I think it's always worth it to, to look into if, if new hotkey uh, hotkeys that are available or control like features, mm -hmm. if you can imp implement them into your game in a good way, then you should always look into that. Yeah, great. So we are coming to the end of the interview. Would you say some words to all your fans that will be watching you in Red Bull Wololo? Just a uh, big thanks for supporting me and sharing for me, and I hope I can make you proud. 
Great. So thank you very much for the interview, Viper. Looking very forward to meeting you in Germany. Thank you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.